right. Hello. Uh, Good morning. Could, could you give us your introduction? My introduction. Uh, yeah, okay. My name is Laura Kretschmer. I'm Professor Emeritus of Audiology. That's AUD. Um, I started at the University of Cincinnati in 1967 and retired uh, in 2009 as emeritus professor. <clears throat> what brought you to UC? Um, well, I came, I was in uh, graduate study at um, Columbia and then I took a job. Uh, I had been here before and I took a job because I wanted to come back to Cincinnati. I liked it. I'm from <clears throat> I'm from the Midwest, from Kansas. But I liked it here. What did you like about Cincinnati? Oh, I don't know. Just nice people. Unusual. <laughs> uh, cultural experiences. And I like the Reds, Cincinnati Reds, and you know, just... Sports. Yeah, lots of stuff. Yeah, so uh, how did you become interested in communication studies and disorders? Uh, <clears throat> well, I went to the uh, University of Wichita to, uh, and went into a program in communication disorders. It was called logopedics, which is, doesn't mean anything, but um, when I thought that I wanted to uh, work with people who had communication disorders, it seemed like it was an interesting area. And then um, when I was a senior, they had a lecture from Northwestern on hearing, and that grabbed me and fascinated me. So. And I went on to Northwestern and then to Columbia. So what do you hope students took away from your courses? Uh, well, I hope that they took away that um, the client is the most important person, the focus of what they're trying to do, and that they need to be try to be client-centered rather than working on the disorder, uh, work on the, helping the person with a disorder. So I think I got that accomplished pretty well. Were there any other core values that you wanted to instill in your students? Um, well, I was concerned that they <coughs> um, had uh, professional focus and that they belonged to a professional associations and that they um, continued to study throughout their life, not just while they were in graduate school. Um, I think I accomplished that too. Uh, what was the hiring process like at UC? Um, in 1967 the hiring process was uh, that you talked to whoever was offering the position and then you went into a, an office with the dean of the college who was traditionally an old white guy and uh, you sort of made your case and then they made you an offer which was sort of a take it or leave it but I wanted to be here so I took it. What was your relationship like among your colleagues? Um, well, over the years I had a lot of different colleagues. I had some people that I was very close to and very cooperative with. And I had a colleague or two that were jerks, <laughs> but I sort of lived with that um, and found my own uh, relationships as well. My husband started working here at the university a couple of years after I did, so um, I 
least, and he was in a different department, so at least I was friendly with the people that he worked with. And so, you know, I found support. Did you face any challenges at UC? Uh, yeah, I think that I think that there were a lot of challenges. Um, not necessarily with my job, since I thought that I was free to pretty much run things the way I wanted to run them, what I thought was good educational experience, but um, I think there were challenges with um, salary and with uh, advancement, um, but I made it through anyway. So how did you see respond to your needs? How did they respond to my needs? No, I don't think they cared about my needs very <laughs> much. <laughs> uh, you know, I always had an office and, and uh, resources were, you know, they were there if, I, if needed in terms of media or in terms of uh, materials. Um, Until we had a, uh, until we had a faculty union, I don't think that they responded to anybody's needs very much. But after that, it was uh, it was better. Did you work with others in your department that felt the same way? That felt that they needed union support, or felt that they needed better support. Uh, yeah, both. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think I was maybe not in step with other people in the in the department. Um, I think I was the only one that really felt strongly about the union. Um, but you know, these were people that I got along with, and for the most part, I respected them. Uh, what was your involvement with the union like? Uh, well. I wasn't a screaming radical by any means, but um, I certainly got uh, involved in the uh, process of, of supporting negotiations. Um, I did participate in uh, both of the um, strikes that we had. Um, simply because I thought it was the right thing to do. Would you say like those were successful? Um, yeah, they were successful in the sense that uh, brought the administration to the bargaining table and um, sort of set a precedent that uh, bargaining was better than than uh, not having. classes or having the, the idea of the strike out in the community. Um, for the most part, I think that uh, it worked out until a little later in terms of, of the administration. At some point we did get an administration that was not interested in negotiation. Was there a particular administration that you could think of? That didn't support negotiations? Yeah, yeah. Mm, well, I don't, I don't, uh, since this is for posterity, I don't care to name anybody particularly, but um, when Henry Winkler was president, um, he understood the issues and supported negotiations. Um, Nancy Zimfer was somebody who more recently supported negotiations. Um, in between there were a couple of people that didn't. Was there a particular administration that stood out to you at your time at UC? 
Um, well, I mentioned Henry Winkler, and I, I thought he was the epitome of, of uh, what a college president should be. He was erudite and, and thoughtful and uh, willing to, to respect the faculty. Um, uh, he was a pretty decent guy. And uh, I thought, uh, although she came late in my uh, tenure here, I thought Nancy Zimper did a very nice job. The community didn't like it because she made sure to fire a basketball coach who needed firing, but, uh, you know, she was, uh, she understood the process of bringing people together and cooperating, so I thought that was important. What are your thoughts on Warren Bettis? Yeah, you brought that up before. Um, well, you know, he, he was a, everybody's fair-haired boy, sort of. Um, and I think he thought that he had sort of reinvented the process and made it all open to everybody. Um, yeah, I mean, he was okay. I, I didn't exactly see what the attraction was, but um, I liked some of his appointments. I liked his uh, uh, dean of education that he appointed and a couple of others that I thought were um, people that sort of saw broadly what the issues were and made a lot of effort to be innovative. Um, you know, he, he wasn't very high on my list, but, you know, he was a nice guy. Uh, so why do you think UC wasn't able to respond to your needs properly? Well, sort of responding to my needs uh, would be, you know, do a fabulous job of upping everybody's income, including mine, and uh, providing a new building and doing all kinds of support of faculty. Um, and I think that, that what happened over the time that I was here um, was that the, the relationship with the state and the finances, or lack of finances, um, sort of created a problem with lack of support. The students started to get some of the things they deserved, but I never, I didn't think that the faculty was getting the things that they deserve. What steps did you particularly take to try to, um, you know, gain like a better salary? Uh, well, there was, um, an instance, I'm having a little trouble putting it in time perspective, but I believe it was in the late 70s when uh, there were a number of women who were senior faculty um, that presented a case for improving salaries, uh, specifically for those women. <clears throat> and they were all in, which I was at that time, they were all in senior ranks associate or full professor. And uh, so I participated in that arbitration. I don't recall that it got me anything. I think it did help one or two people who were really uh, egregiously uh, low in terms of their salaries. That was the primary effort that I made. Would you say it was successful? For those one or two people, I thought it was, I think it was successful. I think they did get uh, a little more appreciation from their various departments. Um, I don't recall getting a huge jump in my salary, but I did get jumps when, uh, uh, when negotiations sort of panned out, so uh, 
I think the thing that was annoying to me is that I thought I was doing as well as my husband. And he actually came in a couple of years after I did, and we were at the same rank. Um, and he was always making at least uh, ten to twenty thousand dollars more than I was. Yeah. Yeah, and you two worked on some research, at, like projects and books together too. Sure. Yeah. And the books that we published, the books, a couple of books that we published were together. Um, and you know, my name was on as was his. It was not his fault. Um, but I think that pretty well spoke to how things were. Let's see, were there other events or incidents that were handled poorly by the university? Yeah, well, uh, I didn't, after the, uh, this was 1970, after the shooting at Kent State, uh, there was substantial unrest here on this campus as there was at most of the Ohio school campuses. Um, and it required a lot of demonstration by students to get any response from the, from the administration. I don't think the way they handled uh, legitimate student complaints uh, was really the best way to handle it. Um, and I sort of didn't get particularly in later years, how negotiations were handled. Um, pretty much told the, the faculty representatives at, at one point, this was in the 80s, I guess, late 80s, um, sort of take it or leave it in terms of we're not doing X or we're giving you Y, but that's it. Um, and the administrators were not really involved in negotiations. They just sent in a lawyer and said, this is how it's going to be. Um, it's not really collective bargaining in anybody's mind. Did any faculty leave because of this? Uh, I'm sure that, I, I don't know about 1970, uh, Later, I'm sure that there were faculty who weren't retained or didn't, uh, I don't mean they were fired, I mean they chose not to stay. Uh, let's face it, we're a little, in Cincinnati's a little bit um, sort of inward looking and conservative. And I think it's I think it's been a challenge for uh, some faculty who come on and, and can't find a support system that they want. So they've fled usually for uh, better salary and better working conditions. Uh, so are you familiar with the case with uh, Colleen McTeague? She sued the university because she wasn't getting paid enough, she, like her salary was too low, and so she actually won that case. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, was she in uh, geology or what was her program? Uh, it doesn't, that one doesn't ring a bell. Yes, geology professor yeah. in uh, two, 2007. Oh, okay, that was, that was sort of more recently. Um, there, were, there were actually a couple of names that are escaping me. There were a couple of similar cases before that. Um, uh, well, I'm 
not so good with names anymore. Um, yeah, I, I would hope that uh, they would, I understand and I, I'm sure that it happened and I'm sure that she had a case and I'm sure that she should have been reinstated and or gotten better salary, I'm sure, that, I'm sure of that. Gutzweiler, the person I was thinking of, Catherine Gutzweiler, who was, hmm, I think maybe she was classics, I'm not sure, um, but she was denied tenure and uh, there was a lot of negotiation going on. Uh, it was clear that she should have been granted tenure. Um, and I think that case was resolved in her favor. And I, I'm not sure of it. I would think it was probably the 80s. You'd have to look it up. Do you think this affects like women faculty and how they, you know, are able to like teach and interact with colleagues? Well, I think there's no question that uh, You know, if you're not, if you do the, if you put in the work, and that was certainly one of the things that happened with the, when I was involved in the complaint in the 70s, um, there were one or two people that, uh, women, who should have been advanced, put in the work, uh, did as much or more than their male colleagues and weren't respected for that. Uh, I think there's no question that that uh, there are issues, and I think there could probably continue to be issues. This is, this is not new for us, or the university, or for women in this context. I think, I think it's probably pretty common, to be honest. So how have you found your support system? How did I find my support system? Yes, you Maybe. mentioned how throughout your years, you know, you've oh, people oh. that were, you know, like-minded and it's kind of helped you with challenges. Sure. Well, I think you have to be willing to reach out and to, uh, to uh, see people that are interested um, in the things that you're interested in, maybe outside of teaching even. Um, I was on the faculty senate a couple of terms. Um, although I didn't really think the faculty senate had much pull, but anyway, I did that a couple of terms. Um, so the people that I found as a support system were people that liked other things besides teaching, not that they didn't like teaching, but other things in the community, um, so theater or movies or good books or all of those kind of things that you do to develop your cultural life. And so how should faculty go about finding their support system if they can't find that within their department? Well, that's a good question. I think you have to be willing to um, try to survey across the university and find like-minded people. Sometimes it's in research. Um, like-minded people who are interested in teaching. Um, look for any resources in the university that might be uh, involved in development. Uh, one of the things that I did participate in that was helpful, although it didn't take me into administration, was a year-long program for women uh, to develop their leadership abilities and to promote um, likelihood of their entering or getting a chance to enter administrative positions, which of course is a way to advance. Um, and I did, I did participate in that and found a mentor, but the mentor wasn't able to take me on, so I didn't, I didn't get past that particular 
event in terms of doing administrative things, although I, I was a department head for several years. Program head, actually, not department. What did you do as program head? Uh, well, uh, one of the things I did was to help develop our application for accreditation for the, the program from the American Speech Language Hearing Association, uh, which was to put together a report and gather data on uh, student success and so on. And uh, that was successful. We did get accreditation. This was in the 80s, I guess. Um, and then I tried to help resolve some of the disputes between faculty and, and uh, students and I had some success there and other things that were not so successful. What was the process like uh, gaining that position? Well, uh, we had a, a program head who had some issues um, couldn't be, didn't need to be reappointed, shouldn't have been reappointed. He had, had some health challenges and wasn't, we weren't really getting support from the administration to help him deal with those health challenges. Um, <clears throat> they looked around and said, well, who can be program head? And, there I was, I was the appropriate rank, and really the only person with abilities and rank experience, so whoop, I got to be program head. Mm -hmm. So depending on the circumstances, would you say communication is a challenge, like, I guess like navigating different like, uh, uh, like department dynamics? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm sure that that is critical. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't particularly good at that. I tended to want to do things my way. I didn't warn people quite enough about, <laughs> uh, about, uh, some of the decisions that needed to be made. So I was moderately successful as a program head. Um, I also didn't, wasn't willing to put up with <clears throat> inappropriate behavior from some of the faculty that were responsible. Um, and so I did tend to confront some of them. Um, and that didn't, that didn't earn me any high marks. So I, I would say, yeah, that, that I did okay, but um, I wasn't the best uh, negotiator, let's put it that way. Do you think it's because people have different expectations? Oh, because I'm a woman, you mean, or just uh, different expectations of? of uh, uh, I guess like the circumstances and potentially you know being a woman yeah oh I, I don't think my gender was the problem I think it was my attitude <laughs> <laughs> so you know it, it, you know I was satisfied with some of the thing that happened happened in our program but uh, there were other things that that I didn't do the best job in the world at If you could go back, what types, like, what kind of things would you have improved? Things. Are you talking about in my whole tenure? Uh, what was, like, the program, particularly? Well, uh, 
couple of colleagues that um, who had in, inappropriate behavior uh, that I would have tried to have found some administrative support to help me uh, rein in that behavior and um, get some censoring of those folks. Um, that would have been useful because we could have saved ourselves some heartaches at some point. Uh, yeah, I, I, the, the primary problem with colleagues who are, who are doing inappropriate things is that you have to have administration who's willing to support you in calling those people out. Um, and they were, you know, I'm talking about men who were doing inappropriate things with students. And I didn't, I didn't feel that I'd ever gotten any, when I reported these things, I never got any support from administration. They weren't willing to call these folks out. This is well before Me Too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so keeping the higher ups like accountable is very important. Uh yeah. Well there there were certainly people that uh didn't want to deal with some of the obvious problems and as a consequence the problems didn't go away, they sort of persisted. Did you want to elaborate on any of those issues, or you'd rather not? No, I'd rather not. Okay, that's fine. Um, so let's talk about how UC has expanded. Were there any like difficulties and transitions from being a city to a state school? Well, I thought we were all excited about going to be a state affiliated school. I think we had. Uh, unrealistic expectations about what it was going to mean from a financial standpoint. Um, we were a nice little city university um, and we needed, we were able to take more students and we needed new buildings and other kinds of resources, financial resources, and we thought that the state was going to give us those. Um, and then we got a basketball arena, but that's pretty much it. <laughs> Very quickly, um, the resources got reduced, and then pretty soon we were state affiliated, but but not really um, re reasonably funded. Um, so I think that's the point at which we started to work hard at uh, getting research dollars and doing other things to try to support the university. Did you witness any tension within the community as UC expanded? Um, you know, if there was some anxiety, then I try to point out how one stays safe in any city and uh, then assure them that, that uh, you know, we'll take good care of their kids and, and uh, if they do reasonably smart things in terms of where they walk at night, why it could be, you know, things will be all right. I don't know. We haven't ever, at least in my uh, experience we didn't ever lose any students to violence or anything of that sort. A couple car break-ins, but that, that's not a bad thing. That happens everywhere. They break into cars in the suburbs, too. Yeah. So what do you think of the implosion of Sander Hall? The implosion of Sander Hall? <laughs> I 
Well, I parked on the street to watch it. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of an odd thing, but um, I suppose it was a easy way to get it down. Um, I think that uh, that the, it had a lot of bad design features in the first place, so uh, I think probably they avoided having some people trapped on the upper floors and when, if the building got on fire that you know, could have been a real disaster from that standpoint. Other than the fact that it happened, I didn't really have any strong feeling about it. Yeah. Um, so did you think maybe like it was poorly designed because UC was expanding too fast or? Oh, well, maybe they picked the wrong architects. I don't know. I, <laughs> it's just, um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't really think of it in those terms. Um, and in point of fact, uh, it hasn't, I mean, there, there's been significant problems with housing, on-campus housing, for a long time, I think is probably still going on a little bit. They've opened a couple of dorms, so things things are probably better, and then you can see all of the apartments that are, uh, that have sprung up around the university, which I think are, has been a help. Um, well, I mean, there. I think there were some bad decisions that didn't have to do with expanding, but the Crosley Tower has always been unbelievably ugly. So <laughs> it's it's. I understand it's coming down eventually, and you know, and they put up some great buildings. Um, so from that standpoint, I think the the, the university architect has has done some pretty good things. Yeah, so have you seen ways in which UC has connected with the community? Um, yeah, well we have, this isn't beside the point, this is actually the point. Um, we have a, a, a small clinic in our department for uh, people with, adults with hearing loss who want service and uh, some children who, uh, preschool children and so on. And we've tried to reach out to the community to provide that service, although there's plenty of service, other services around the city. Um, I think that the, sort of consistently that uh, day of help sorts of things around the city has been promoted. Um, athletic teams are typically going out to help uh, clean up and help with, with um, playgrounds and that kind of thing. Um, I think there's certainly been some effort to try to, to improve community relations through the um, on-campus police department after the DuBose problem. They, had a lot of meetings to try to um, take the community's opinions into account and to try to do more cooperative things. Um, they describe themselves as, we describe ourselves as, a, as an urban university, so it's important to fit with urban s settings and to try to do things to improve urban settings, because so many people in the United States live in urban settings. Um, yes, it, it feels like there's a lot of effort to reach out to the community, involve the community, do things that are attractive to the community in terms of CCM performances and, and uh, other kinds of, of uh, events. How has the campus become more diverse over time? Mm -hmm. Well, 
I think I think there's been effort to um, invite different groups of students in. For example, the first gen um, house and uh, the students that are there is, is one effort. They're, they're not all people of color, but they certainly are uh, students who where they, the family has never had anybody in college before. But uh, I think that's been a good effort. Um, most of the programs that I know have some familiarity with are working hard to recruit underrepresented students, nursing, for example. Um, uh, College of Allied Health Sciences worked pretty hard to try to recruit underrepresented populations. Um, I don't have any numbers on how that's working, but my assumption is that things are improving in terms of diversity. Do you have other data that suggests that's not true? Or? Oh no, I just like was oh, curious you're just, to see you, how like you've seen the campus become more diverse. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's I think that's the case. Uh, it feels like it and sort of as I think back on the rather large number of students that I've actually seen, it seems like it's more diverse. Um, I hope that's happening, continues to happen. Yeah, does it surprise you that students come here just for, you know, co-op reasons or do No, research? it doesn't surprise me a bit. Um, uh, the DAP programs, some of the DAP programs are the best in the whole country, not just by rank, but by, in fact, by experience and co-op attracts a lot of students, as it should. Um, it was an exceptionally good idea. It started here uh, and the idea of co-op started up on the UC campus. Um, and it it makes sense that, that students would come here for that. CCM has several programs that are um, nationally ranked. Um, so no, it doesn't. It doesn't surprise me when I meet a student who's come from California or someplace else on the West Coast, or uh, even other places on the East Coast, or internationally. Nice. Um. So how has technology uh, changed over time? with your, you know, teaching, you know, at UC and everything? Well, uh, I mean, the, the, big, the biggest obvious things are going from one overhead projector to uh, multiple media things in the classroom so that you're getting, you get video or movies or, you know, internet or anything that you want in the classroom. Um, I think the biggest change has probably been uh, student access to uh, various kinds of media. So it used to be the case that maybe there would be one or two people that would have a laptop in a class, I'm talking about in the early 2000s. And then by the time I finished, everybody in the class had a laptop open thought they were a little bit more involved in the laptop than they were in my very interesting lectures, but there you go. So, it, you know, it's the same explosion in the University of Media as it is in all of society. So everybody's got a phone, everybody's connected, which is okay. I spend a lot of time on my phone. Was technology ever like a distraction? For students in your class? Uh, in every class there are always some students that are distracted by the media so that you know they're sitting away in the back of the classroom and they're surfing and they're punching each other and laughing and pointing at the screen and so on. 
Um, I usually just said, uh, don't do that, because I'll call you out. <laughs> uh, a couple times I did, and then they quit. Um, yeah, I think, on the other hand, sometimes if you don't have an answer, why somebody can go on Google a question and get an answer and contribute to the conversation. Um, I used uh, something called Blackboard, which is the uh, online uh, service that UC has for uh, courses. Um, that was very helpful, I thought, when we started to do that. And this is early 2000s, I think. Um, so you could put all of the lectures up, you could put all your materials up, you could put the assignments up, you could take quizzes in, take exams in. Um, didn't have to do a lot of paper stuff. Um, uh, that, that was extremely helpful. I was, I was very happy for that addition. And it facilitated um, off-campus online courses too, which I, I did teach some. How has uh, technology like impacted things like research? Um, well, I think it's I think it's made a large difference. I can remember when I was in graduate school in the '60s. If we wanted to search in the library, we had to go and go to the card file and open the card file and pick out what we wanted and then see if we could find it on in paper copy. Um, we haven't done that for 25 years because everything you want is online. The li all the library resources are online. Um, articles. Uh, you can borrow books from any place in the whole state uh, if you need a book. It's uh, facilitated research question about particularly the, the data interpretation and writing. So um, that part has, has made a huge difference. So where do you see the future of UC going? The future of UC, well, um, I think they have ensured that it, it will continue in, in some fashion. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about the number of students that they want to cram into this place, but um, certainly has programs that are cutting edge across the university. And uh, I think it's established its place in terms of innovation and uh, I'm assuming that there is there is a future. Do you think being a heavy like research college affects the way professors interact with students? Well it is it's an interesting change from uh, people can be tenure faculty where the focus is on research and then there will be educators, clinical educators, that will do teaching. Um, yeah, I think there's probably been some change. I know one of the things that we were kind of grumpy with Ohio State was that, that uh, at least from undergraduate programs, and I'm, I'm reflecting on the students that have come to us from undergraduate programs, uh, the majority of courses were taught by graduate assistants or um, I guess they would be sort of clinical associates, um, which was too bad because, uh, and I'm talking about speech and hearing, not, I don't know, about other programs. Um, one of the things that, that we could say as a, as a program and department uh, was that the, the 
tenured faculty all taught, and the student had an opportunity to deal with, uh, hear from people who should be good at what they're do to, doing. Just because you had tenure didn't mean you were a good teacher, but anyway. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I think that, that research has kind of pulled uh, people away from teaching, which is an important function to my way of thinking. What is your uh, proudest moment at UC? My proudest moment? Hmm. Well, um, I guess there are two sort of proud moments. Um, 20 years ago, 21 years ago, we went from being a program in arts and sciences to the College of Allied Health Science into, into our own department. And they had uh, two different celebrations for that department. One was a 10-year anniversary, and I was named as one of the um, outstanding contributors to the college at the 10-year anniversary. And at the 20-year anniversary, which just happened uh, last year, I was named one of the 20 for 20 uh, in terms of contributions to the college. Now, I'd already retired at that point, still doing some research things. So uh, I was pretty proud of both of those accomplishments. Did you participate in any of the bicentennial like celebrations? Um, I did go to the bicentennial for the Alumni Association and uh, one of our alums from um, from the Department of or the program in audiology uh, was named as an outstanding alum and received something called the Marion Spencer Award um, and he was a, a guy that I had had as a student and uh, had supported his development growth. He's not doing hearing things now. He he's a, was a lawyer and then an uh, entrepreneur. Uh, but we were quite happy to uh, have had him in our program. Uh, and I got invited, we got invited to something else in November for, I don't know what, exactly what that is, dinner or something. So we're fairly active in, in uh, giving, so my husband and I, so um, we get invited to a lot of stuff. Are you, do you still stay connected with students that have graduated? Yes, very connected. We have uh, some excellent friends who are still here and even some that are a little further away that uh, we're, uh, we're involved with. As a matter of fact, one of two different ones of our students helped plan our 50th wedding party, which was a Harry Potter party. And oh, that's cute. It was cute. And they planned it uh, with our funds. Um, but, and it was a great party, so we were proud to know those people, and we still keep in touch with them. Yeah, so I know you and your husband really like books. You guys like to donated like a collection. We did you. donate a collection of um, Native American children's books to the um, education library. Um, and it's um, about 300 books in the collection right now, and we'll, we'll be adding to that. And these are books that we collected in the, in the Southwest primarily when we were vid, vid, vacationing there. So we were very happy to uh, make that endowment, um, and it was the first one that the, that the education library had received. What sort of impact do you hope that it has on the university or people that, you know, view the collection? 
uh, well, we're we're certainly hoping that uh, it expands cultural awareness for the teachers and the students who get to see the books. Those, those books can be loaned out. They can be read there, but they can be loaned out for student teaching experiences. Um, and they're primarily um, Native American, uh, some Alaskan, and some other um, uh, Native peoples. And we know that's not a population that we have a lot of students here who are who are Native American, but we certainly hope that they'll be aware of, of what the history was here as well as what the history was in the United States. Is there anything else that you want to talk about? Um, no, I, this time I didn't get a chance to mention that we love UC Athletics and we're all involved in that. Um, we have uh, season tickets for everything, women's soccer, uh, lacrosse, uh, we go to all the games, women's basketball particularly, men's basketball and football too, but uh, they like women's sports, volleyball, um, and I've, we've been involved in uh, contributing to the Women's Excellence Fund, which is a support fund for um, women's athletics particularly. Um, so we're contributing, continuing to contribute to that fund and to support women's athletics. And part of that is because we've had some wonderful student athletes in, our, in the speech and hearing program. But uh, additionally, uh, we like the coaches and we like the student athletes, so we want to contribute there. That's awesome. That's just like another way to connect with students. It is another way to connect with students, and um, in point of fact, regardless of what one reads, uh, these ladies are athletes and students, students first in many cases, so uh, we know that they're uh, on their way to developing their lives and having an impact. So we're happy about that. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, is there anything else? No, I, uh, I think that's about it. Anything else from you? Uh, nope. <laughs> okay, have you got your time? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, thank you so okay. much. Okay. <laughs>